Exactly. Now, you, when you said when you went to Liberia, yeah. um, when we had a conversation before, but we're bringing you in now, yeah. that you went in for one reason, but that's the time that the Ebola yeah. crisis yeah. Yeah. happened yeah. and yeah. you had that major breakout. Yeah, Liberia was uh, a life changer for me because mm -hmm. I went as a technical specialist on adolescent uh, sexual reproductive health, you know, mm -hmm. to provide, uh, to help the country build its program on young people. How do you reach young people? How do you help uh, transform their lives? That was my uh, designation. Mm -hmm. But two months getting into the country, there was the biggest outbreak of Ebola and uh, everything got disoriented. Yeah. I uh, had to take on a new responsibility of being the uh, coordinator for my office of the Ebola response on, response on behalf of my office yes. in the entire country. Yes. It was uh, an experience that I can't forget because it was very traumatizing, uh, life-threatening and uh, also kind of changing because I then realized that look part of the work we do can also be very dangerous. Yeah. And then you it, hadn't been in that I kind hadn't of been in that before. environment before. I had never known that the kind of work we do also has another side to it. Because you're not only looking at lifestyles of people, but lifestyles of people in different contexts. Because yeah. the same issues will remain when there's an emergency of war or in an emergency of disease like in Ebola. So li Liberia took me to that point where, first of all, personally, I was affected because um, I, I got stigmatized as well. Because uh, being from uh, Liberia, during that time, I tried traveling. First of all, it was so difficult to leave the country. There's a time yeah, you we, said they closed the borders. Yeah, they, there's a time point. they closed the borders, no flights in, no flights out. So we are left there to die. You know, no one could leave, no one could come in. So you, you would wake up sometimes and walk through the streets or drive through the streets and see people falling down, medical services closed out, nothing. And it was very scary. Uh, but we also tried to... I tried to, when they finally opened up the borders and we could fly out, you know, when I tried to go to, uh, I remember I tried to go to Dubai, I wanted to go for a break. Yeah. And uh, they gave my wife a visa, they said they could give my wife a visa, but they, they, they said they couldn't give me a visa because I had a <laughs> permit working in Liberia. So because of Liberia, I couldn't get that visa. That was that wasn't good. Yeah. Coming back home, still the same thing. You know, people that I worked with before, people that I knew, kind of kept their distance, thinking I would probably be infected mm. and I could expose them wow. to this disease. Yeah. So it was very traumatizing. But luckily for me, I had a very supportive family mm -hmm. that was there for me during this time. And I kind of went through this healing process. But naturally, I, I think I needed more than... Uh, just my own social support to come through the trauma that I experienced. But uh, the good side about that is that it gave me another huge experience when it comes to working in emergencies. Because then I learned that, look, my work can't only involve young people, but it can involve women, you know, because whenever there's a situation of an emergency, the most vulnerable populations are women and young people, most vulnerable. So Liberia told me that, that became a huge lesson. And um, after Ebola ended, the rest of my years in Liberia, I moved towards uh, gender. Uh, gender. That's when the shift it, happened. That's when the shift happened. Okay. I, I moved towards gender equality programming and uh, prevention of uh, gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. So, because I, I saw the effects of uh, emergencies and the escalation of vulnerability of women during my time in Ebola, Wow. So I, I, I felt that I should um, also focus more on that area. And it, it, it helped me grow into that area. By the time I left Liberia, I was uh, heading the... Um, I went in as a youth specialist. By the time I left, I was gender and youth specialist. Because then I was heading the program on gender. I was also heading the program on youth. Mm. And uh, it, was, it was quite a life a game changer for yeah, me life to this day. Yeah. True. to this day i mean you you mentioned that you know it was very traumatic yeah. and it's funny you know when you're not in the situation or people on the outside looking in and then also you know sometimes governments really try to minimize um how much information gets out yeah. um but you're actually right in the eye of the storm yeah, yeah. Um, and then you said it was very traumatic because i think you also lost friends Did you yes lost yes friends and we had friends we were well? working with um nurses mm. that we were working with that uh, 
different hospitals uh, in the in central Monrovia mm. who actually died. Mm. Uh, we knew these people. Did you we, ever we, feel we, like you know you weren't gonna make it? I wouldn't make it. Well, there are moments like there was this moment when I actually thought I had probably contaminated. I went into this cab one time and uh, it had rained, so the cab driver had left the windows open before, so I called him uh, to pick me up. Mm. And then he comes, I sit in the car and the car seat is all wet. And remember that time, you know, any fluids uh, are not supposed to touch your body because yeah. even a speck of any fluid can get you really sick. Yeah. So I was really scared. I thought he had been taking some patients to hospital oh. or something like that and they had, you know, the fluids in the car. And uh, for 21 days, I, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't rest, I was, I just didn't know what was happening to me. I was like, if anything happens to me, because the incubation period is 21 days, yeah. I am, the worst you part... You just kind of have to wait. Exactly. And the worst part is that um, when, if I was to get Ebola and die in Liberia, there was no way in which my body would ever come back. So, actually, I, do, I got scared of my body being cremated and burnt in Liberia okay. more than dying itself. Because I, right. I, I was at least let my family see my body, you know, let my body be taken back home and my family can bury me, you know. Uh, but, you know, that scared me a lot. I'm like, okay, now if I die here, I'm just going to be burnt mm -hmm. and that's the end of me. Wow. Yeah. That's... That is a, a valid concern. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, your family needs closure sometimes. Exactly. That's one of the hardest things exactly. for closure. You also, you also mentioned that, and I remember reading about it, that yeah. there were a lot of Ugandans who were yeah. really, really instrumental in being able to manage yeah. Yeah. the crisis. Yeah. So I, mean, I think that's something um, mm. you got mm. to see firsthand. Yes, we had, um, luckily for us, during that time when I was there, we had the WHO representative who happened to be also Ugandan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, he pushed for the government, as he was the overall coordinator on behalf of the UN, to have uh, Ugandan doctors come, because they have a lot of experience with handling Ebola from the Uganda's experience in the past. So they uh, came into the country and uh, they were assigned different uh, units. We used to call them Ebola treatment units. Mm -hmm. So they were assigned to work on the island, they call it the island ETU. Um, um, somewhere in the west of Monrovia. Mm -hmm. uh, that ETU, most of the other ETUs had a fatality rates of over 90, 80%, but this one was under 20%, wow. which proved that actually the, most of the recoveries, the, those that survived, survivors were more coming from the Ugandan treatment uh, unit. So we even had more of the patients request and demand that they be moved there. Right. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Ugandan doctors did a great deal <coughs> mm -hmm. in rehabilitating, helping people recover. More than uh, I would comfortably say that, more than uh, other, you know, missions that came in to support. Mm -hmm. Because they had very good hands-on experience and uh, that really helped a great deal. They were even rewarded. They were, they were given medals by the president then, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, Salif uh, Johnson, mm -hmm. for the good work they did. So yeah, that's something that I, I witnessed. I saw that and mm. commended mm. them for the fact that they came in and did such a great job. Mm. Another thing to be proud about my country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Now coming out of such a, a crisis a situation in an area, did, do the organizations provide some maybe counseling or therapy? Is that well, something that was an option for you? Because you mentioned that you know it took some time to heal. Yeah, yeah, it, it did. Well, the organizations provided these options, but I, uh, I personally didn't, you know, ask for it. I felt I could manage, you know, I, I could, I could deal with that. Uh, it was a personal decision, but okay. they were giving options for people that needed counseling, you know, uh, psychosocial support to help them recover from the trauma, especially employees. Uh, we also lost fellow employees, by the way, about two UN staff died during that. So the services were there, mm. but I, I chose not and um, focus on getting back to my work and getting things out. It's my way of dealing with such situations. I just bury myself in my work <laughs> and I move on. No, no, that's not a very good thing. <laughs> 
I know, but it's been working for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's been working for me for mm. a long time. So I, yeah, I just did that and I, and I moved on. Okay. Yeah. All I think right. I'm okay now. You think? Yeah. But it's taken some time. <laughs> yeah, it's taken some time. Yeah. <laughs> you can still talk about it though. It's never too late. <laughs> it's never too late. I consider that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So how long were you in Liberia? Four years. Uh, okay, so 2014 to 2018. Okay, that's yes. a long time. It was, it was a long time. And that's the shift in your career when that you started looking exactly. at gender-based violence. Exactly. Okay. That's no. when I started looking at gender-based violence. Yes. And particularly how women, um, victims of abuse, yes. uh, domestic violence mm. being on the high. Mm. Um, now moving from Liberia, I moved to the Pacific and uh, realized that the situation is as, as grave as it is in Africa. Because I thought maybe the issue of gender-based violence is mostly in Africa because yeah. of our culture. Because like yeah. mm -hmm. you know, we have this uh, imbalance in terms of the, um, the, 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 you know, you have the paternal, you know, in system, society. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, where we, we, we tend to believe that uh, women are less important than men. So I didn't expect that. When I went to the Pacific, I realized it's even a bigger problem. Like mm -hmm. for instance, in the country in Kiribati, mm -hmm. where I work, 68% um, of women have experienced some form of physical or sexual violence in their life. 68%, yes. So if you have 100 women, let's just say 68 Let's women. say 68 of them have sexual violence. Mm. And, um, I mean, there are countries right now that have these movements around femicide as yeah, well. Um, yes. I think South Africa probably has some of the highest rates yeah. as well. Yes. Um, but uh, I, find, I found it interesting that you said that when um, you're talking about gender-based violence, you're actually really targeting not just the women, but trying to have yeah. this conversation with the yeah. men as much as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you see, um, most the notion about violence in homes or intimate partner violence has always been inclined to perpetrators and women as victims. Yes. We've uh, paid a lot of attention to that and um, forgotten to go into the, the nitty gritties, you know, the real core causes sometimes. We've had uh, research that has shown us that um, most times women themselves are perpetrators and what do i mean by that um when mothers are for instance raising their girls in most in most societies they'll tell them look um if your husband doesn't beat you or if he doesn't show any form of jealousy by making sure you he controls your movements and is in, is is you know breathing down on you then he doesn't love you so there should be some form of restraint exhibited by your husband or your partner towards you and that's the only way that you would know that your partner actually loves you. Right. Mothers tell that to their daughters. Mothers also tell their daughters, that, look, if your husband, if your partner beats you, it's okay. That's how marriage is. Stay there. All right? Mm -hmm. Don't ever come back. Yeah. In Uganda, for instance, we have this culture when you go for Kwanjula, they'll tell you, uh, the parents will say, oh, we have handed over this girl and uh, your bed has been destroyed. Never come back. It's no option. You know? Yeah. So we've, we've told our girls that, look, there's no option. When you leave my house, you've gone. You've, you're married. Mm -hmm. Stay there and do anything that happens to keep in that marriage. Yeah. Now, this is culture, right? But we don't think about, we don't give these girls an option that in an abusive relationship, you actually can get out. Mm -hmm come back to your father's house where it's safe and life can move on without you going back to that relationship. Yeah. We've not protected them against that. We've not given them options. They are by ourselves being perpetrators mm -hmm. because then we build this um, character among us victims or girls that it's okay to be abused mm -hmm. and it's okay for you to, to, to go through emotional, you know, psychological, economic as well as um, sexual abuse and you have all you have to do is tough it out as a yeah, woman because you're not the only it. one yes yeah, people only, also... i had gone through it so it's very normal mm. and and that's wrong you know yeah. so our 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 advocates our work our efforts against gender-based violence have not given this attention that much okay. they've always focused on oh how do we protect 
the survivors we call them survivors if a woman has been a victim uh, has been a, has gone through this experience and we call her a survivor how do we create a safe haven for her how do we you know most times we'll focus on making sure she gets um, counseling she gets clinical care she gets legal and you know protection mm -hmm. and all those elements but we don't think about you know what about the environment in which she's grown up mm. what is how what about the foundation what are the values what are the values what's the value system of our culture about yes then our boys what do you tell our boys most times we always focus so much in our cultures and this is i've seen this is it's not only africa you know But we don't think about, you know, what about the environment in which she's grown up? Mm. What is how? What about the foundation? What are the values? What are the values? What's the value system of our culture about? Yes. Then our boys. What do you tell our boys? Most times we always focus so much in our cultures, and this is I've seen. This is it's not only Africa in other parts of the world. Yeah, even we, where you are, you're it, seeing even this. exactly where I am. We focus so much on telling the girls do this, do this, do this, and the boys nothing. We don't teach our boys not to be violent from uh, from from childhood. When they are playing with their sisters, we don't talk to them about being respectful. We don't talk to them about not objectifying persons of the opposite sex. And by doing that, we are we are ourselves perpetrators. Because then we are building a new generation of uh, imbalance, gender inequality. Because gender-based violence is as a result of gender inequality. Yeah. Every time I see the woman as a lesser being than I am, then I feel I have a right to bash her. Yeah. I feel a right to deny her uh, uh, resources, to deny her, uh, you know, free freedom, you know, for her to choose where to go, who to see or move with, and do. things mm -hmm. of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, most of the times, we always forget also about the boy child yeah. and the men themselves. So, this to me has uh, this experience has taught me that we need to be able to uh, change, reform the way we look and dress. Uh, uh, gender-based violence and look at all these different components mm. across the, uh, mm -hmm. the horizon. So what are you doing now to address that gap? So some of the things that I'm mentioning, uh, the programs, so my role in terms of my work is to make sure that this new, or not necessarily new, this, this um, evidence-based uh, uh, information that we have uh, or approaches is what we use to inform the programs to respond to gender-based violence. So that we just don't continue doing the traditional way of, oh, just go on the media and say GBV is bad, GBV mm -hmm. is terrible. That doesn't change. Yeah. Uh, we need to address people's knowledge, first and foremost. We need to impart on their attitudes so that we can change their practices. Now, when you start with uh, young people, for instance, mm -hmm. when you're looking at young people, and you go and talk to them through education on gender equality, then you're doing something good. Then they'll be more respectful. So we do support and we do work on um, sexuality education mm. in schools, which sexuality education has, has components of, of gender equality. And we have evidence that when young people go through this type of education and have access to this information, they are more respectful they are less likely to be violent partners when they grow up. Yeah. So when we do that through programs on sexual education in countries, then that helps secure you know, the future generations to change this because it's, it's, it's a behavior mm. and, and you don't change behavior overnight. True. So that's one of the most long-term strategic uh, approaches that we use. Uh, the short-term strategic approaches we use is targeting males, male involvement, and we've noticed that most times we leave the men out of these conversations. Yeah, I mean, you have all these discussions regarding the girl child sometimes uh -huh. and, and uh, women empowerment. And, and then you look around and it's... Only women. Only women. Yeah. Yet we are a society where men and women live side by side. Exactly. And, yeah. and we never even realize that the, you know, the, the men have a bigger say 
because sometimes if you're talking about some of the issues that create uh, this violence is you know a fight for resources within a family so if the men have control over most of the resources and they're not involved in these conversations then we are most likely not going to change anything if men can understand that look you have a small piece of land allow your wife or your partner to use some of that land get that income and let it be her income okay that is one way of empowering her and she can be meaningfully helping contribute to the, to the betterment family. of the family yeah. mm -hmm. at the same time by doing that it empowers the woman mm -hmm. right so when we don't do that and we only focus on the women and talk about women empowerment but not involving the men ultimately it won't work because the women have to go to the men to access these resources yeah. mm -hmm. so the approach of male involvement is very critical yeah. and and, and uh, in my job uh, my organization has uh, put that as a key strategy even in our global strategy yes. involving men to be able to change this and of course we continue using the traditional ways you know mm -hmm. the, the media we continue using the advocacy yeah. the legislation mm. you know the legislation but the most important um, part about you know having this transformation is moving it from upstream by by upstream I mean getting out of talking about policies mm -hmm. laws you know all this you know high level stuff and get down to the grassroots yeah downstream mm -hmm. talk to the people on the ground. go to the people have conversations you know we will spend millions of dollars talking about gender-based violence through or we're going to do these policy reforms you're going to do all this kind of stuff but in reality if the conversations don't happen at the household level yeah. at the village level the support groups that exist you know women have groups like in uganda we have um, what we call uh so i'm trying to remember now the uh like the women's support like the women's circles oh yes yeah like circles yeah. yes the women's circles mm -hmm. uh there's, there's even a local name i've forgotten it anyway mm -hmm. those are social systems already in place social structures already in place which we can use mm -hmm. okay these women can then be the agents of change mm -hmm. to help other women out there yeah but most times we bypass this or we overlook them and mm -hmm. we don't actually put them to the right use. Yeah. So we have all the ingredients to really make a transformation about uh, this issue um, if we put our minds together and work collectively together. Mm -hmm. Yeah.